Good morning and good afternoon to um, everyone who are participating in today's um, session, today's webinar um, hosted by China Britain Business Council and the EU SME Center. Today, um, we are happy to invite you to um, a discussion on um, practical guides um, in retail and China marketing trends in 2022, especially for um, data security and privacy um, compliance. Um, China's, um, before I start, um, as you can see on the screen, uh, introduction to today's um, agenda, we are um, happy to have uh, speakers um, from two companies. Um, to start with, uh, Mr. Mark Schaub, managing partner, uh, London for King <coughs> and Wood um, Melsons. Um, later, we will be um, having um, Mr. James Herberts, uh, Managing Director of Highlink UK, as well as uh, his colleague, uh, Ms. Pamela Ma. Um, and uh, after which will be followed by a Q&A uh, session. Um, throughout uh, today's uh, webinar, um, all the participants, uh, should you have any questions, um, you can already type them uh, in the Q&A session. Um, before we start, uh, a small introduction about um, uh, the EU SME uh, Center. Uh, the EU SME Center, as today's uh, host, we are a project founded by the European Commission uh, already in 2010. Uh, this is 12 years ago. Uh, our focus is to provide support uh, for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises from Europe, getting them uh, ready to do business uh, in China, as you can find uh, the link to our website uh, on the slide. And currently, um, after 12 years, we are in the third phase of uh, the project, which is running until March uh, 31st uh, this year, and will be followed potentially by next phase and currently um, the phase uh, is implemented by five uh, implementing partners of course including uh, today's co-host the china britain business council uh, as well as four other partners uh, in china and in europe our services mainly lies uh, in these four aspects and of course all our services are free of charge for European SMEs, but also uh, includes um, companies, SMEs from the UK. We have a knowledge center uh, where uh, we have published over the years uh, over 200 comprehensive market reports and guidelines and case studies. Uh, we have an advice center, uh, our in-house and uh, external experts provide free of charge inquiry services uh, for European SMEs covering a wide range of topics. Uh, we also have a training center. Um, traditionally, we give uh, workshops offline, but during the COVID days, uh, many of our webinars, uh, many of the trainings uh, are also organized in the format of uh, webinars and online trainings. Last but not least, we also have a, a SME advocacy platform uh, where uh, we work on uh, the advocacy front. Uh, we constantly uh, voice on behalf of European businesses uh, to improve the business environment for European companies in China. Um, a brief uh, overview of the upcoming activities um, of the SME Center. Um, we are organizing um, several webinars on uh, fashion uh, apparel export requirements. Um, later, we will be uh, launching uh, a report again together with the China Pretty Business Council on automotive and electric vehicle markets. Um, we will also uh, be organizing a capacity building webinar series, uh, including topics such as cross cultural communication, cross border payments, on logistics, on digital marketing as well. Um, and um, here on this slide, you can find the links to the different services that we offer uh, here at the SME Center. Without further ado, I would already like uh, to uh, introduce our first speaker of today, Mr. Mark Schau. Um, Mark specializes in foreign direct investments, um, M&A, and restructuring uh, in China. 
And Mark has uh, advised on foreign investment projects in all major sectors in China uh, with a cumulative value exceeding uh, 20 billion US dollars. Mark is uh, familiar with China issues faced by companies of all sizes and is a trusted advisor to many companies ranging from family owned businesses um, to Fortune 500 companies. And Mark has been uh, lead counsel for clients um, in acquisition, MA projects, outsourcing. Uh, OEM contract manufacturing, technology licensing, compliance, restructuring, joint venture disputes, fraud, distribution, uh, as well as day-to-day uh, -day corporate advice. Um, last but not least, Mark also has a YouTube channel, uh, China Art of Law, um, where he discusses commonly encountered businesses uh, uh, and legal issues in the China market. Um, without further ado, Mark, um, the floor is yours. You can start sharing uh, your screen. Thanks, Liam. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so thanks um, to EU SME and uh, CBBC for the opportunity. Uh, let me just see how I can uh, make it when I'm doing a slideshow. Oh, worked better last time. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So I think everybody can see it and hear me okay. Is that right, Liam? Okay, maybe not. Okay, I'll keep uh, going ahead. Um, I think you should switch the presenter views because now we see um, uh, we see it differently rather than a full screen. I see. How do I do that? That was the same problem last time. Let me. Um, uh, I will. I think on the top uh, display settings, you can uh, yeah. switch presenter view. Um, okay. Is that better? I think now on top, uh, uh, display settings. Yeah. I don't see that. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. Let me uh, uh, close that and I'll try again. Sorry about that. It, it was happened yesterday as well. Let's see. Um, hopefully this. Hopefully this one will work. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Good. I don't know what I did differently, but anyway, I will now continue. So I think today we're talking about a topic um, about the new personal information protection law. And um, you know, our law firm is a large Chinese law firm actually. So I, uh, I've been working in China, in Shanghai from 93 until 2018, and then came to London uh, to help with our European offices. So we have five or six offices, about six offices in Europe. Uh, but so so my business my, my work has always been in relation to China, and I think yeah this first slide is just to talk a bit about uh, you know where China is going. Also for small and medium sized enterprises, uh, yeah there's been a real boom in technology. You know Tencent was only back in 1998, Alibaba 1999, uh, and so you know we've seen that the Cyberspace uh, Administration was only found in 2014, the e-commerce law is in 2018 as well, as well as GDPR, which is the thing which perhaps inspired the Chinese personal information protection law, which we'll call people, just to make it simple. So I think the, you know, the, the real issue is uh, why data has become important in China is that it's the growth of online business, it's the growth of data-driven companies, and also China after the European Union is really perhaps the first country uh, to really issue a comprehensive uh, personal information protection law. And as European companies would know, the GDPR really uh, did make a lot of changes necessary as to how they interact with their customers. So just about PIPL uh, itself, uh, it came, it was, you know, people have been talking about it for a long time, but it, it was then, you know, passed on the 20th of August, and then it was made effective on the 1st of November. Uh, last year. So people only had two months to analyze and comply, which made it a bit difficult. Uh, and so I think it's a bit different from many laws. Uh, we've got the Chinese version there and the English version if people wanted to have a look. Uh, but it's the first time I think Chinese law really has dealt with individual data in a comprehensive way. And there are some differences um, uh, compared to most Chinese laws. One of them is uh, the PIPL uh, seeks to also have extraterritorial reach. So even if you are a European company and you're only selling uh, goods via 
cross-border e-commerce or you're targeting Chinese customers for investment or something like that, uh, you know, the PIPL also seeks to act beyond the borders of China, which is quite unusual uh, for Chinese laws. So the main changes are uh, it's, it's really not about, sometimes people act like the laws are always against uh, foreign companies, but this is really not the case with the PIPL. The PIPL is really primarily about individuals having more rights over the use of their data. And I think this includes rights which are similar to GDPR, like the right to access your data, to correct your data, to know what's happening with your data, to ask for your data to be deleted. And so I think it's very similar to GDPR. The consent has to be informed. And I think one of the reasons why this is the case was that the Chinese authorities, um, you know, they were a bit concerned that the tech companies that we were talking about a few minutes ago were becoming too powerful. You know, they've got too many algorithms. They do too many things. They collect too much information. And so I think it's firstly, they wanted to protect individuals uh, rights to privacy and rights to their own data. But secondly, it also was a bit of a national security risk that so much information was collected. And you know, a lot of Chinese companies have been engaging in very bad you know, activities. So some, uh, there was like, I think maybe uh, 50 apps last year deleted uh, by the Cyber States Administration because you put it on your phone and it would get access to your voice, to your emails, yeah, it would just run rampant through your system. So I think people were very worried about this. Uh, I think data sharing and transfer, perhaps for foreign companies, you know, the big difference is for certain types of data, it is um, sensitive to transfer that cross-border. This has been a problem for, for foreign companies for a while. I think it's a manageable issue, uh, but we have a lot of European companies, you know, companies like Bosch or Daimler or... Siemens, et cetera, they would have large engineering projects and these joint R&D projects necessitate cross-border transfers of information. And so I now, I think with um, the PIPL law, you have to be a bit more careful about how you transfer the data, what kind of data you transfer. Um, so that's you know, perhaps uh, something to keep in mind. The, the PIPL also requires you to have systems in place and controls. If you're a you know, European Union company and you're compliant with GDPR, none of this will be too much outside of your comfort zone. Um, you know, to date, uh, most of the clients we've had who've approached us about this are Chinese companies and German companies. Uh, I think American companies haven't really you know, taken it very seriously yet, uh, but a lot of the large European companies are taking it seriously. Uh, and then I think with the transfer, it's also data localization. So especially sensitive personal data or children's data, uh, that needs to be located onshore. And if you did want to transfer it, you'd either have to anonymize it or get special uh, permission and pass a cybersecurity check. Okay. So here, I mean, we'll uh, ask the um, EU SME and CBBC to share the PDF. So. I won't go through everything in detail. And if people have questions, you know, feel free to ask questions. Uh, but you know, consent, there will be a lot of issues about consent. Uh, they won't be able to make the information public. Um, they will have to tell you who is getting access to your consent, uh, to your data, why they're using it, what's the purpose, and also for how long they're going to keep the uh, data. And then in particular, sensitive personal information uh, things like facial recognition is a big issue nowadays, children's information, financial information, health information. Uh, these things all have to be dealt with in a very sensitive way. And then I think, you know, perhaps beyond that, it's also worthwhile mentioning you know, things that you might not think are sensitive in Europe can be sensitive in China. So um, uh, things which are like uh, for autonomous cars, you need to get lots of photos of the geolocation. That kind of information is sensitive in China. So if you're a company that's dealing with, um, you know, autonomous cars and you've got cameras, uh, this will be sensitive because you'll be taking photos of people and photos of places. So those kind of things should trigger a thought on your side. Maybe we can't send the, the um, data overseas. Maybe we have to keep it in China or maybe we have to deal with it in a way 
that it is possible to think about the seeds. So the impact assessment, um, I think in the interest of time, uh, I won't go into detail on these kind of more uh, technical as aspects, but this is just really a bit about you know, what kind of personal information are they collecting it? Like I mentioned, those apps that are collecting a lot of information, which has nothing to do with their app function, nothing which is legitimate about it. These people will not pass that kind of assessment. And it will also balance your personal rights and interests. I think, you know, it will be a question of whether what the uh, company that says, you know, do you um, agree to me collecting your information? What are they doing with that data? And even if you've given cons uh, um, uh, consent, the Chinese authorities may still uh, block them or close them down if they're acting with data in an improper way. So another one, which is, I think it's going to be a big issue, and there's been a recent uh, law just uh, a few days ago uh, about the algorithms. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> this is about the automatic decision making and the big data discriminatory pricing. And I think, you know, one of the issues is which people uh, are seeking to address is that, uh, you know, very often the algorithms, uh, when you buy something online, you know, three different people might get three different prices based on you know, their profile. And you know, perhaps a bit sadly is that if you're a VIP customer of a company, very often you get a worse price than somebody else because they have like computed that you're an easy mark. So uh, what the regulations say is you cannot use these kind of um, algorithms to do a discriminatory pricing you will also not be able to use it uh, uh, to push information and things like that. So I think, you know, it'll be very important for companies if you do this. You know, so we do have clients who were collecting cookies. They were collecting this kind of information. Uh, they have to be perhaps a bit more careful than they were in the past on these kind of issues. <clears throat> so I wanted to get away from perhaps too much on the, because it's still a relatively new law. It's not a very exciting law. And so I thought we should like get away from just the technical side, but maybe just talk a little bit about how does it really impact business? So yeah, why would you care about business? I think for many people, um, it may not seem very important. I think for people that are interested in doing business with China, I think firstly, it shows that the Chinese authorities are concerned about big tech and they also want to control how data is being used and how it's leaving. And I think most of the concerns are really about the Chinese tech companies, especially those that want to uh, list overseas. So if you really look at the people who had the most uh, difficulties with these new data laws, it's really Didi, it's Tencent, it's Alibaba and all these people. Foreign companies really haven't been affected yet. Uh, so I think you know, that's the first thing is people shouldn't overreact. They shouldn't be too, too nervous about it. I think the second thing is it's a very broad thing. It will affect almost everybody. It will affect you know, even companies who don't operate directly in China, people that operate offshore. Um, and so I think uh, you know, it's important to make sure that you're compliant, at least with the major uh, you know, issues. Um, I think the, the rights are very legitimate. So it doesn't seem to be something unrealistic. And so, you know, if you're a European company and you've been complying with GDPR protections for your consumers, but you haven't, uh, you know, uh, extended that to Chinese uh, uh, consumers, the question is why not? Uh, but at least it should be relatively simple for you to update your systems and get things ready. So the, the, the other side of it is, I don't think many EU SMEs will be in the firing line, but the penalties really do have real teeth. So they are very big. So for big European companies, they have to be concerned about it. And then I think also for European small SMEs, one of the problems will be, uh, not problems, but one of the issues is you can expect very active enforcement because this law uh, is not just the regulators who can enforce it, but consumers can take action if you've breached their rights. So that can be difficult. And I think I'll talk about it in a little bit later, 
uh, a bit about how also con uh, so people selling on uh, Tmall or you know on through WeChat or these kind of things. These guys will also be uh, dealt with as well. I think. So here was the thing about Didi had a big issue. They couldn't enter into the UK market mostly because of the technology and the data. And there was the story about yeah you know, 43 different apps were breaking data transfer rules. So yeah, you know, it is a hot topic in China. So will it affect you? I think uh, I just mentioned that it's really affecting the big China tech companies. But I'd say, you know, what I expect is if some people will remember maybe about five years ago, there was um, a big clampdown on counterfeit goods on e-commerce. And, you know, the Chinese authorities didn't go after the individual sellers. They went after Tmall and Alibaba and said, you have to do better at making sure that counterfeit products are not on Tmall. And so uh, I think it's going to be similar with this. So I think if you are really got a big business and it's e-commerce based, uh, the gatekeeper will not be the Chinese regulator. It's going to be Alibaba. It's going to be Tencent. It's going to be all these companies that don't want your problems to become their problem because they're such a big platform. And PIPL is only one of a number of data laws, but there's a lot of specific data laws dealing with e-commerce platforms. So I think it's very, very clear that they are a target. So, uh, so they will not want to have, maybe you've got one small problem, but if there's 10,000 uh, EU SME companies who are all non-compliant, then that's a big problem for a company like Alibaba. Then I think the <laughs> next issue will be uh, consumer-facing companies. So if you're a cosmetics brand or you're selling a car or you're selling you know, some fashion item or whatever, I think you know, the growth of social media, the, <clears throat> the way that the internet's progressing and also the consumer protection laws, it really means that consumer complaints are very expensive in China and it is adding a lot of risk to doing business in China. And this PIPL, which enables consumers to attack companies who breach their data rights is just another indication. So I think if you're a consumer facing company, you have to think a bit about that kind of risk. Uh, there are foreign companies handling mass personal data. Uh, I think, you know, it's um, in the law, it's about a million data subjects, which doesn't sound like that much really, if you look at China, but uh, I guess for an EU SME, it's uh, unlikely. Uh, but if you're dealing with, I think it's 100,000 data subjects for uh, sensitive data, then you fall within that regime. So probably not many of you companies will be affected, but you know potentially your customers or bigger companies may be. And then sensitive personal data, which I've already mentioned, so education, healthcare, fintech, location tracking, these are all sensitive personal data. So if you're involved with any of those, you may need to have specific advice. And biometric personal data, yeah, that falls within sensitive I'm just putting it in because a lot of people use facial recognition, fingerprints, voice, or other data. I mean, like the banks here uh, in Europe, they use it all uh, for their apps. So people or apps which rely on these biometric data, they're going to have to make sure uh, how they deal with authentication and how the data is being used. So I think the other people uh, which are, you know, at risk, and again, maybe not that many EU SMEs, but yeah, the stuff will be, do you, your products, do you collect personal data as people are using your product or your services? And this isn't just consumers. So I think there'll be a lot of EU SMEs. We had a client once who had a certain type of truck, and that truck had a monitoring device that would be constantly sending information back to the European headquarters. And they could even remotely stop the truck and freeze the truck and do things. So, you know, if you've got that kind of internet uh, connectivity with an IoT type of thing, then you might need to look at things specifically. Uh, the other big one, which was what Tesla got into trouble for, you know, with all those cameras, if you're taking photos of passerbys or the surrounding environment, firstly with the passerbys, you know, they haven't agreed to be, you know, captured or the, their imagery shouldn't be captured. So that's an issue. And then the surrounding environment is more a Chinese national um, uh, security interest. They don't really like to have lots of photos of the Chinese maps or mapping uh, being sent around the world. So if you're involved in technologies that you know 
uh, ha involve that kind of aspect, you should check this. And then the issue has been for most of our clients, they are able to deal with this. These are surmountable problems. So it, one client was uh, a company that hearing aids. Uh, so in that case, the medical data was okay as long as we made it anonymous that nobody could trace you know, who was where or what. Uh, you couldn't connect the data with an individual. Uh, clinical trials, similar. Uh, for another client that was doing autonomous car technology, uh, we, they, they were able to get the software that it no longer resembled. You know, so you'd still have the stuff, but you wouldn't be able to see that that was you know, the Tiananmen Square or that building was the Jin Mao Tower. You know, they, uh, they used the data in a way that you couldn't work out what the actual physical geography was. You would just work out the speed and the distances. So those kind of people may have more complicated issues to deal with. Cross-border transfers, I think I've discussed it already. Um, so if you're doing a lot of uh, information or if it's a very interesting, uh, sensitive information, then you'll probably need a security assessment. Uh, I don't think many of these people have done it uh, yet, so it's still quite unclear what will happen. But it is clear because, you know, like I said, the large data companies, especially those listing overseas, there's more regulations. And these regulations say the security assessments would have to be repeated every year. So I guess this is what will happen for big companies like Bosch or Siemens, who probably have a lot of cross-border transfers, they'll probably have to undergo such a cyber security assessment. I think also we'll see many more people using cloud uh, services in China, like AliCloud or Amazon's uh, cloud in China. And you know, there'll be, you're gonna have many more contracts on data processing. And just from a compliance perspective, you'll probably make sure that you know where your data is going. After sales support, just quickly, because I mean, a lot of you probably do this, uh, yeah, after sales support will, especially if you're collecting information like you're you know, working for a bank or you know, these kind of things, uh, you will fall within uh, the, the threshold. Uh, we think it's going to be between 100,000 to a million people, depending on what kind of personal information. And you know, an issue would be, uh, yeah, I think this one's mostly we're talking about consumers because I think EU SME companies are often consumer facing. But if you're a a supplier in the automotive industry, you, know, you should know there are these draft automotive uh, data security uh, regulations because, you know, primarily because of autonomous cars, people understand that, you know, the autonomous cars are going to be like giant mobile phones and collect lots of information. So if you're in that kind of space, you probably need to uh, look into it a little bit more in detail. Okay, miscellaneous that I might just press. So just quickly some practical hints. So, you know, uh, we can share with people a checklist uh, for them. I'll pass it on to EUSME and CBBC. Uh, and that's kind of a, a self-assessment to see if you've got any major issues. I think what most people do is uh, if they're looking at it, they need to do a bit of a data mapping and try to work out what data do they process, where they get it from, uh, how do they use it, and then I think you can check if you face any big issues. Then I think it's localization. I think the short rule is if you can store it locally, store it locally. Um, HR, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have the uh, opt out clause that GDPR or the, the way out of it. So the Chinese uh, law doesn't really allow you to send the information overseas without consent. So I think, you know, it's best to perhaps put this in your employment contract that certain information will be shared with your headquarters. And then I think with R&D, you know, you may need to have certain R&D conducted in China. And then a task force, you know, what most clients are doing at the moment is, uh, at least the European clients, they do have a number of different people from business units looking at this issue. So there'll be almost always somebody from HR, somebody from finance, somebody from sales, and then these people will roll it out uh, towards China. Now, obviously, you have a very chi large China office, maybe the Chinese office does it themselves. Uh, third party compliance, I guess this is an issue. Um, like I said, most of us are always thinking about consumers when we look at it, but you have to think a little bit about when you're doing a compliance check on your suppliers, you are collecting information on them. So I think there's two aspects. Firstly, you will probably want, 
in your suppliers going forward that they comply with data. This is something which I haven't seen in the past. You know, uh, we will have law, you know, we'll have in the contracts, you are complying with employment, health and safety, minimum wage, environmental standards, but data has never been in these contracts, at least the ones I've seen. So I think going forward, probably people will require their uh, suppliers to, um, you know, confirm that they do, they are compliant. But then secondly, when you're doing your compliance work, you have to be careful that you'll be collecting personal information from your suppliers. So you should also get that consent to, and also be careful how that information is used within your organization. Uh, so internal feedback, um, I think, so I think we won't go into detail on that. Legislative updates, look, there's a lot happening. I think every two weeks there's new regulations. Uh, I would warn people, you probably don't need to be as concerned as if you were General Motors or a very large company. I think as an EU SME company, if you could just achieve a GDPR level of compliance in China, you will be fine. So I think it's easy for European companies. Uh, but if you are in one of those areas, which I've mentioned before, which are very sensitive, it might be worthwhile just checking and making sure there's nothing which uh, could hit you. Okay, so yeah, one thing just very briefly, everybody will need a personal information uh, protection officer. So companies that are acting in China, so if you've got a subsidiary in China, you will need a contact person. Uh, I don't think this person, similar to the European uh, type of um, uh, uh, PIP, uh, this person is not gonna face big liability. It's more just somebody that if, you need to have contact with the Chinese authorities. They know who to talk to. So they don't have to phone up the company in Finland. There'll be somebody in China that they can talk to. And that person has a bit of an understanding if there's a data issue. So if you're a European company doing business with China uh, and it's a sizable business, you should have some kind of person there that can deal with this. Uh, that would be in case there's a big hack or something like that. So I think for most people, it won't be a big issue, but just let you know about it. Um, who will enforce it? I think we mentioned already, look, it's mostly the Cyberspace Administration of China. They're very active. They're also the people taking the lead on cracking down on tech companies. I think they're very busy. So I think they're not really caring much about the foreign companies. So I don't think they're the main issue. So I think again, just worthwhile saying it one more time, if you're reliant on the big tech companies, you will probably need to be compliant because they will self-regulate and they will want to make sure that you comply. Uh, and the internet platforms have lots of different obligations. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think they will require you, like, you know, also if you want to sell cosmetics on um, uh, Tmall, you have to show that you own the brand. So I think similarly, as this gains ground, they will require you to show that you've got the different consents and technology solutions in place. Okay, consumers, I think I've uh, you know, already addressed it, but you know, one case there is just from China Daily. Yeah, in 2020, there were over 3,100 personal data breach cases. So these are consumers taking legal action against companies. So this is a new area where we're seeing you know, a lot of activity. Non-compliance, it's very expensive. I mean, it's not gonna be for the EU SME companies, but uh, fines of up to 50 million renminbi, and you could lose up to 5% of your annual revenue. So if you're a big tech company, you can see this is very serious. And if you're really bad, they can uh, suspend or close your you know, um, business down. <laughs> and like you know, China removed Didi from the app stores, you couldn't update it, et cetera. So they do have a lot of power and you know, it might be a bit of an aside, but if you were invested in a China tech company, you'd be very concerned that the impact that it could have on the uh, tech company. So I think, yeah, this is why it's serious. Uh, here's more stuff about, you know, it's more technical retention period, who can process it, entrusted process. Yeah, you know, most people, we've seen this most commonly with European companies that have their HR, you know, data processed by a third party. But these kind of things, nobody's had a big problem yet. It's mostly limited to having the right contracts and getting consents from the person providing the information. 
So I think uh, I will just let people look at the slides for this later. This is a comparison on some of the main issues under the GDPR and then contrasting with the PIPL. And you'll see, yeah, they're very similar. There are a few little differences, but I think it's fair to say that the PIPL was largely inspired by GDPR. And so then I think just in summary, I think people should be aware of it, but they shouldn't make it too, you know, uh, be too nervous about it. I think, you know, be compliant, but make it simple as possible, but you don't make it too simple. So I think um, pretending it doesn't happen is not helpful, but, you know, we shouldn't be overly concerned. Data is becoming more regulated in China. And just think about how you interact with Chinese consumers, uh, data, or if data is somehow, even in a B2B company, if you're dealing with data, especially across border, whether you have any specific uh, concerns. Uh, if you're a GDPR compliant company, it's not too much of a journey. I think it's relatively easy to become largely compliant. I think consumer companies will be subject to a lot of self-regulation by the big e-commerce platforms. So probably get ready for that. And I think one thing is, I've talked to a bunch of data lawyers in Europe as well. I think most people say full compliance is actually never really possible but you need to be largely compliant. So because it's fast moving, it may not be possible. So I think uh, that's where I'd end it today, Liam. Uh, we've got some connection, uh, we've got uh, some details for some videos we've done on this as well. And also, you know, people wanna contact us or ask questions. We're always happy to have a, you know, complimentary you know, discussion to see if people have any big concerns but I might stop sharing the slides and hand it back to Liam then, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for your sharing. Um, I take this chance to encourage um, everybody or our participants again, if you have any questions for Mark, uh, type them in the Q&A section. Uh, we can interact further um, in the Q&A session uh, with Mark. Um, moving forward, um, allow me to introduce um, our second uh, speaker, uh, Mr. James Hebert, uh, together with his colleague uh, Pamela. Uh, about James, um, James is Managing Director of Highlink UK. Uh, with 14 years of international marketing experience, James has lived and worked in Shanghai, New York, Tokyo and London. Uh, James' career began at uh, a WPP's global network. Uh, James was selected from uh, 1,500 candidates to be given a place on the OQV Marketing Fellowship. And within six years, uh, he was promoted from graduate trainee in London to chief of staff for the global CEO OQV and Matter based in New York, uh, working across a variety of blue ship international brands such as British Airways, SAP and Unilever, uh, then to China, where he spent five years launching uh, and marketing UK luxury brands. And now as the Managing Director for Highlink UK, James combines his marketing skills with his knowledge of Chinese culture to embrace Highlink's ambition to make more Western brands a success story in the, fa uh, in the world's fast-growing consumer market, uh, China. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm passing on uh, the floor to uh, James and Pamela, uh, who will be sharing with us uh, today on top trends or marketers uh, need to know about. Thank you very much, Liam, for the introduction um, and for inviting us to speak today. Uh, and also Mark for that presentation, which um, was really insightful in how uh, PIPL is so influential um, in China, and particularly the lens we're going to give today is how that affects marketing as well. Um, so a bit about Highlink, uh, we're actually the first native Chinese digital agency to move from China and come west and set up here in the UK. Our mission is really simple, we act as a bridge to help our Western brands access Chinese shoppers, and we've got some very close partnerships with the big tech giants. Um, and as I say, so I'm joined with my colleague Pamela, who will be presenting some of the sections. We've got 15 offices in China that's um, enabling us to have a hyper local insight. China is a constantly evolving market, um, a lot of innovation, and we need to have that local insight to really fuel strategy and, and insight for our clients. They range from big blue chip brands 
We're working hard at the moment for the launch of the Olympics happening next month in Beijing with official comm supplier, all the way through to smaller boutique brands, so like one-off luxury goods shops in London. Uh, and we pride ourselves on that diversity of client from um, luxury to FMCG to um, automotive, right across the board and understanding the consumer. How we help our client is everything from the first steps, digital strategy, really understanding how the market ecosystem is there through to social media, working with influencers, um, media buying and planning. Uh, and that's how we you know, uh, enable ourselves to, to have insight on, for example, PIPL. Our, our media billing last year was about one and a half billion dollars. So from that, we gain a lot of data and we have to be very sensitive to how that data is handled particularly on behalf of our client and with the tech giants. So just a very quick filter on uh, the learnings that Mark's just shared and how that applies to us as a marketing and an ad agency. Um, as Mark explained, you know, in principle, they're very similar, PIPL and GDPR. So if you're GDPR compliant anyway, those best practices uh, are already set up and you'll be aware of, of you know, good uh, regulation when it comes to, to data rights. I think on the whole, from our experience, the PIPL is more restrictive uh, but as long as you get those principles the same, for example, understanding the localization of the data, whether it's being exported, identifying up front who in the project is the data controller and who is the data processor. Uh, as long as you have that clear, you can always you know, navigate through these, these regulations. We're just doing a project at the moment whereby we are effectively the data processor. We're doing some research on markets and the client is the controller. They're not gonna see the data of the individuals that's us to get our hands dirty with that. We will only present back the insights and the research. So those roles are very clearly defined and that makes us compliant as to how we deliver that project. So why is this uh, relevant? Well, applying this to marketing, there are some really key events throughout the year that we do have to apply um, data protection to. One of these is, is the biggest shopping festival in the world. This is called Singles Day. It was founded by uh, four students who felt sorry for themselves back in 1990s and they found the most single worded day in the calendar, 11-11, uh, the, the ones representing being single. Uh, and it was really just a bit of a fun to start with, but Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, saw a huge commercial opportunity here to make it into a shopping festival. And it's since grown into this staggering uh, festival. I could share some eye-watering numbers with you, but to give one example, the uh, gross merchandise volume of last year's uh, November 11 was around 84 billion US dollars. Now, when you compare that to some countries' GDPs, I mean, it's absolutely staggering. What we do see from um, events such as Singles Day is there's a lot of marketing themes that sets the tone for the year ahead in terms of different consumer groups, different innovation. And we're actually going to share three of those themes we've seen and, and what we think is going to be prominent for uh, marketers looking forward to, to this year. So first was green, green shopping. I'm just going to share a quick quiz with you now. And I think we've got a poll coming up on the screen. Question is, what percentage of consumers um, that were surveyed said CSR, so corporate social responsibility, would influence their purchase decision making? Do you want to just quickly... Choose. So how important is basically CSR in the eyes of the Chinese, Chinese consumer? There's four options there to choose from. <clears throat> Just wait a couple of seconds for people to put their answers in. So the answer is 75%. Now, many of you may be surprised that, you know, sustainability is now such a high um, topic on, on consumers' agenda in China. This wasn't the case a few years ago. So we're just going to share some examples on why that's prominent and what that it means for marketeers. Yes, yeah, thank you, James. Uh, from here, let's look at a big background about green shopping. Currently, uh, the Chinese consumers of, AG, of ages 30 to 49 have higher consumption of ability, while the Gen Z and even genera uh, younger generation from 20 to 29 show the most interest and wellness in the sustainable consumption. So they are representing the future and they are going to have the highest consumption ability in the near future. Also, at the same time, 77% of consumers are price sensitive if 
the price of sustainable pro products was higher than the standard product. And also we can see that Alibaba Group has uh, took a lot of action uh, to um, make the uh, sustainable choices more accessible to the Chinese consumers. For example, in 2021, Alibaba's logistic company Tanya launched 100% biodegradable tariff-free packaging. Uh, this may be uh, familiar to us uh, here in the UK. I know a lot of brands already have the sustainability into their brand DNA. While this is definitely matching the uh, the trend here in China. And also uh, at the same time in the 2011, 2021, uh, Alibaba's group online marketplace, Alipress, launched a dedicated session for eco-friendly products. And they give a lot of coupon to encourage the consumers to use uh, this to shop the green category. And when we're talking about the double uh, eleven, we cannot miss live streaming, definitely. So they are also uh, promoting with uh, China's top celebrities on the green lifestyle and appeal to the uh, younger generation. And also at the same time, the Alibaba's cloud clean energy uh, cuts a lot of uh, carbon emission, um, which is definitely matching the uh, long-term strategy uh, in China on that. And another fun thing is about uh, gamification. So uh, for each green purchase consumers make, they own energy points on Alipay and Forest. And we can use that to plant a new, a real tree uh, in China. And a lot of my friends are really passionate about it it's because they are feel um, uh, achievement feeling to have a real tree planted. So during the single state purchase alone, more than 58,000 real trees will be planted across China. Another fun thing here is we can see self-driving robots deliver uh, 1 million orders during the single state 2021. And some of the brand example here, in 2021, Nestle part, part, partnered with Tiny Out to allow consumers uh, Nestle pocket packaging to be delivered uh, to be picked up and recycled for free while they are uh, mobile. Uh, I think a lot of uh, Western brands like Nestle already have that uh, uh, DNA to uh, have the sustainability and also to recycle, etc., which is very good to manage the trains. And also another brand to feature here is Unilever. During Singles Day 2021, all of Unilever's e-commerce orders were packed with plastic-free and recyclable materials. And also they are encouraging to recycle um, the empty bottles, just like the booth here is encouraging us to recycle the empty bottles of, of all the uh, cosmetic um, brands as well. So a quick conclusion here, we can see 2.5 million consumers purchased the green products during the double 11. And um, for brands, we really need to show dedication to sustainability to appear to the Chinese consumers. So for those already have that in their brand pillar, it's good to emphasize. And uh, it's definitely a bright future for, uh, for this um, part for green shopping. So uh, let's look at the early inclusivity as well. And we have a quick question here, uh, quite interesting. Uh, by 2050, how many people in China are estimated to be over the age of 60? I think we should have a poll here as well. Let's quickly choose. Couple of seconds. Okay, let's look at the answer is one in three. So that percentage is quite high. Uh, let's look at a bit background here. So Based on the China's 2020 census, people aged 60 or over made up 18.7% of the total population. And we can see that the percentage is growing bigger because there is a trend that the younger generation in China is not very willing to get married or having children. So uh, we can see the percentage is getting higher uh, in the near future. At the same time, the Chinese internet users over the age of 60 has increased from 4% to 10% from 2017 to 2021. Um, I can feel that as well because my grandma know how to shop on Taobao, you know, to order things she wants. And my mom is a frequent user for Douyin, which is a Chinese version of TikTok. Uh, we can feel that around us. And also, we can see that Chinese civil economy is estimated to be worth 880 
billion US dollar by the end of 2021. So a lot of action is uh, already on the way to match that trend. For example, Taobao launched a new model for the elderly, which includes enlarged text and icons, uh, voice comment technology, and simplified navigation, of course, to match their uh, user behavior. And we can see the elderly's favorite uh, products are smartphones, jackets, work coats, all very practical, but it also depends on uh, which brands made themselves easy the approach to uh, elderly customers here. And uh, there's a lot of uh, IPs worth to um, mention. One of them is a famous IP on Douyin called Kang Kang and his grandpa. Uh, they rose to fame on Douyin in 2019 by posting his stylist wardrobe. And um, since then they have a lot of uh, sponsorship by Adidas, Anta and Nini. And also another brand worth to mention here is a loungewear brand called Neiwai. Originally, they, they are like more targeting 30 to 40 uh, year old women. And we can see that uh, they have the global brand ambassador to be the 50 year old Chinese actress and singer Fei Ye Wang. Uh, though she looked young, but she definitely already in her 50s. And, she, uh, and also the brand extended uh, their potential target customer to include both young and older consumers. So a quick conclusion here for the elderly inclusivity. Um, the elderly population to grow to 366 million by 2050. And uh, a lot of brands, um, it will be good to include the elderly into their potential target customer. And a lot of brand here in Western, for example, uh, the nutrition brand, there is definitely a, a potential market in China. So the third theme that we're going to share with you is around social responsibility. I think what's interesting here, the, the items that Pamela has touched on, for example, green agenda, a lot of these are driven by the government agenda and then put on uh, and related by the tech giants to help implement. So you saw with the green agenda that the tech giants at Alibaba are really pushing their agenda to, to make that happen. And similar to what Mark was saying, you know, the government will have an agenda and then usually to rely on the major tech players to help implement that in the ecosystem. So they then become responsible, which means everybody who engages with those tech giants, which is the only way to do marketing in China, also has to be responsible because they're not going to take the risk to get into trouble from the authorities. So here's another example um, with social responsibility. But first of all, just a quick quiz for you. How much can a farmer... Um, in China, who live streams his produce make per week? What do you, what do you think if you submit your answers? So the answer is one and a half um, thousand uh, US dollars, um, fifteen hundred dollars, which is pretty impressive. This is uh, Uncle Huang. You can meet the Hunan tea farmer, and he's a live streamer. He's got about twenty million followers, um, live streaming his daily life and and. Uh, um, I suppose traits as a farmer. And what's interesting here is, first of all, the government agenda to really push this. So Xi Jinping announced uh, this sort of common prosperity agenda um, and encouraging the tech giants to embrace this and contribute more to society. We also learned earlier about the consumer insight about 75% of consumers now being more conscious of CSR and they'd like that to also influence their purchase decision. So if brands don't listen to this, uh, you know, they're really going to miss out here. And this is a theme which is only gaining momentum in China. So those tech giants are being encouraged. You know, we've seen a lot of them now uh, donating to charity and having systems set up to do that. We saw single day profits expected to benefit over a million people. Uh, Alibaba actually has a system whereby every time somebody was sharing one of their company posts on social media, they were also donating to charity. Here's an example of the mayor of Sanya, who has picked up an unlikely following. So that's just to share a little theme of it. But basically, his live stream attracted over 25,000 views. I actually sold 30,000 kilograms of fruit were sold out in, in two minutes. So that's really showing how the power of that platform uh, can connect and actually add commercial value and, and help those local communities. 
Here's another example of gamification, which we apply to a lot of our clients' work. This is Baba Farm, and it's using virtual reality and sort of a, a gamified approach and a playful approach to grow your own vegetables. Uh, and from that, you can win points and discounts to then buy the real produce offline from, uh, from that local community. Uh, Li Zhe Qi is a, is a phenomenon, really. She's a, a local KOL, key opinion leader, and she lives what you would sort of best define as a slower paced life compared to the rest of China working on this sort of 24-7 um, work cycle. And followers love her. They're mesmerized by her content of living this idyllic country life. She's got 54 million followers on Douyin. Um, and you can tune in, just enjoy watching her everyday life, but also buy her products uh, from the brand that she's, she's created. We've actually seen in more recent times a rebellion from a very hectic, fast-paced life in cities to uh, go to a more slow-paced life, for example, here in the countryside. So another aspect to uh, the social responsibility is a recent increase in um, supporting those with disabilities. Uh, this is a scheme that allowed uh, people with physical disabilities to buy a single shoe at half price. And this is a campaign over the uh, Singles Day, basically saying, you know, you don't need two shoes to be <clears throat> a capable athlete. So big brands were involved with this, like Echo and Reebok, and did a, a really good collaboration with Tmail. Um, you can see here some of the artwork campaign for that. Uh, if you look at these posters here where it says one shoe, you can see on the English, some of the font is missing. Um, and actually on the Chinese, some of the strokes are characters one of, uh, are also missing, but it's still showing that you can still be complete and, and still compete um, by you know, being disabled and only having one, uh, one leg. But it's beautifully curated and the art director did a really good job here, uh, but it shows how there's now uh, more attention and a sensitivity towards this um, as that social responsibility. The campaign was a great success. They had over 120 million views on Weibo, um, we saw 80,000 uh, keywords, search keywords, which uh, shows how people are engaging with it and helping raise awareness of that. So just some uh, key takeaways there for that theme. You know, there are these uh, demographics which perhaps weren't uh, focused on or taken so seriously in the past, but are growing demographics and they have consumer power as well. Um, people with disabilities are making up over 6% of China's population and also looking at lower tier cities where the consumer spending power is also increasing, even for luxury spending. So as a consumer product, I know there's lots of different types of brands here, but the, the key here is to, to make you aware of other demographics which are evolving in the Chinese market for you to be aware of. So just some uh, key learnings and, and themes. that There were many um, themes we could have shared with you today and innovations. But we thought we'd choose three sort of more unusual ones to, um, to paint a, a different picture for you about China. And for those of you who are on your China journey, you'll be at many different stages. You may be just starting and looking to get your first step there, or you may already be established there and looking, looking to optimize. So these are relevant points to you, depending on which, which part of the journey you are. Do always look at these major marketing events, such as Singles Day or throughout the year. This is where you can pick up on uh, themes and insights that will you know, be um, perpetuated throughout the year. And, you know, from that, you can be building your marketing strategy around that. You also will be aware of, you know, we spoke about sustainability, green and the growing population, but also elderly population, but also keeping pace of what I call the innovation is so key. Live streaming e-commerce is something which has really picked up over COVID and continues to be a staple part of the campaigns that we do. And the power of the influencers, the KOLs, the key opinion leaders, or KOCs, the key opinion consumers, continue to have incredible commercial sway, more so than what we see in the West. The Chinese influencers are very different commercially minded. Um, we treat them as a media platform almost. So be aware that you know, these PIPL regulations mean handling data needs to be carefully considered from the very beginning of your project. Um, as Mark was saying, if, if you're an SME business, um, as long as you're, you know, you're, you're diligent and, and have good practice in place on a large scale, this shouldn't really be an issue. But you've got to think about this seriously. You know, if you're hosting a competition, for example, 
if you need to send a prize to those competition winners, uh, you will be handling data. So that should be handled locally. And in your HQ back in, in Europe, you don't need to have that data. You just need to know that you've had five comp competition winners, for example. So think about all of these steps very carefully. Uh, and actually, the tech giants will make sure you know, you're kept in place and you, you're doing it by the books. Otherwise, you know, you'll have your brand banned or uh, yeah, banned from the platform or even um, suspended for a, you know, a month or so to make sure that you actually learn about the regulation. So it can have an impact commercially. So do be aware of that. And I think the last thing to add is just, you know, this is nothing new in China. There's always been regulation there. There always will be regulation. Uh, but be aware it does change. You know, within certain sectors, for example, we have regulations as the type of media we can serve up or the type of content. For example, in the property sector, um, they're very strict because you can't transfer more than 50,000 US dollars outside of the country. Uh, so you shouldn't really be advertising you know, selling properties in the UK or across Europe, for example. So you have to find other ways to do that. But there's always a way around regulation to ensure that you can meet your marketing, marketing objectives. So just to, to wrap up and to share a bit of Chinese culture with you, uh, some of you may have heard this already, but in every Chinese sort of word, there is, is a deeper meaning. And the word for crisis, which a lot of people have seen COVID to be, there's actually two characters, Wei and Ji. One meaning danger, recognizing the crisis, and G is opportunity. So in anything, in any challenge you have, whether you feel there's now more regulation in China, there's always an opportunity there which um, we seek and encourage our clients to embrace. Thank you for, uh, for your time. You can add us on WeChat here or get in touch if you had any further questions. Thank you very much uh, to, to you, James and Pamela. Um, do we have any questions from our participants? Um, maybe some are addressed to uh, my colleagues at CBBC. Do you have any? Um, if there is no um, further questions, um, in any case, I recommend everybody, uh, should you be interested in getting further in touch with any of our speakers, with Mark, James, Pamela, uh, you are uh, welcome to do so. Um, you can also um, write to us at the USME Center and the China Building Business Council. Uh, should you wish to learn more about both organizations and the services we provide. Um, since we do not have uh, any further questions, um, I would like to suggest that we close uh, today's session. Um, thank you again to um, all our speakers um, for uh, your presentation. Um, and thank you to everybody who participated in today's uh, webinar. Um, I wish you all a good day and evening. This is the end of today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.